I'd like to introduce you all to someone. This here is my friend Grayson. He's a crested gecko. He weighs about 20 grams, fits in the palm of your hands. His ancestors come from the island of New Caledonia. And I've had him since my sophomore year of high school. I got him from a reptile show up in Lansing. And that same year, I had the opportunity to do an independent research project for my final in AP at Biology on any topic of my choosing, as long as I could convince my teacher was related, related to biology. And I chose to investigate what it is that makes these geckos so sticky. So if you're not familiar with geckos, crested geckos are one of 60% of gecko species that are able to adhere to just about any surface, whether it's man-made or natural, including things like glass, using the adhesive pads in their toes. And the applications of this, as the scientists have been studying it, is just incredible. Thinking how the study of these little tiny geckos could affect the way you live your everyday life or the way uh, surgeries are done in the future. So scientists have been looking into this since the late 1900s. There's been a lot of theories proposed along the way, including a wet adhesion model that has to do with capillary action, some theories with a suction cup model, some ideas that had to do with the chemical makeup of their toes. And the actual answer was found in 2002 by a research team uh, headed by Keller Autumn from the university, I'm all right, the name escaping me at the moment, but it included uh, from Lewis and Clark, including scientists from UC Berkeley, UC at Santa Barbara, and Stanford. And what they found is that these geckos are able to adhere to these surfaces through the amplification of weak van der Waals forces. I understand a lot of you don't come from scientific backgrounds, so that statement probably, med, uh, probably meant even less to you than everything I've said so far. <laughs> So to give it some context, we're going to take a step back to everyone's favorite general chemistry. <laughs> so hopefully you remember at least that everything in our world is made up of atoms and molecules. Atoms mean the basic building blocks for our universe, things like nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, carbon, all those good things. And atoms are comprised of smaller subatomic particles called electrons, neutrons, and protons. Protons carry a positive charge, are located in the center of the atom, in the nucleus, with the chargeless neutrons. And then electrons, little tiny electrons carrying their negative charge, are orbiting somewhere outside the nucleus. Now, we like to make all these models and rules saying there's two electrons located in this discrete orbital, this distance from the nucleus, and then there's eight electrons in this next discrete orbital. But the thing about these electrons is they don't actually care about all these rules we make and they kind of do whatever they want. So while we can say there's a high probability that they're going to be found in this area, at any given moment, they really could be wherever they want. So take an atom of beryllium, for example. It has four protons located in the center and four negative electrons outside, giving it an overall neutral charge. So just at any given moment, because of this factor of randomness, you might have three electrons more on the left side and one electron closer to the right side, giving the left side a slightly negative charge and the right side a slightly positive charge. And because opposites attract, the next atom of beryllium, its electrons are going to shift into a similar pattern with a little more on the left, a little less on the right, giving it this slightly negative, slightly positive charge. And it's going to do the same thing to the next atom and so on and so on, till eventually you end up with this huge web of slightly positive, slightly negative atoms that overall I'll have neutral charges. This is London dispersion, or more broadly, van der Waals forces. It's one of the three types of intermolecular forces. The other two are a little bit stronger, but this van uh, London dispersion is found in all atoms. So if you were going to use these really weak intermolecular forces to adhere to something, you probably want to increase the surface area of contact. So what the little species like insects and mites that use a similar dry adhesive model for sticking to things, what they do is they have little bumps and ridges in their toes and their feet. So then when they go to stick to things, they're sticking with a greater surface area. The thing about geckos is if you just think about the size difference, these geckos, their magnitudes larger than mites. So they take this idea of expanding surface area and they kind of run wild with it. So instead of being flat or having a few bumps and ridges, 
their toes end up looking a lot more like a, the head of a toothbrush. So they have millions of these microscopic little folds on every one of their toes, creating these little bristle-like structures that are called setae. And the setae, they're kind of beam-like cantilever. They're angled slightly, anchored at one end. And at the end, they split off into 100 to 1,000 more of these little tiny bristles. And these little tiny ones at the end have little triangle heads. So on every one of these toes, when they go and they set their foot down, they drag it slightly on the surface, squishing every, all these billions of little bristles between their toe and the surface, allowing the van der Waals force to occur between their toe and the surface. And just through the sheer number of setae that are present on their toes, they're able to use this really weak force to stick to something, which, if you think about it, it's, just, it's incredible to think about. And through the research and the study of this, scientists have found some incredible applications. And they've been able to create synthetic setae that mimic the same structures as those found on a gecko's toe. Now, they have three really important properties. They're very sticky, very strong. They're uh, self-cleaning. So like a gecko's toe, as you use them, it actually knocks the dust and dirt particles loose. So they actually get cleaner the more they use them instead of dirtier. And then the last one is that they're a dry adhesive, meaning unlike wet adhesives like capillary action, there's no water molecules involved. So with the first factor, the really sticky net part, uh, the first thing everybody always thinks of is gecko tape. So there was a team at University of Massachusetts at Amherst. They created something called gecko skin, which basically gecko tape. And at one index size, not very big, is able to support over 700 pounds, which is just massive. Being able to imagine being able to use that in your in your home, you could hang things with it, or in engineering, or in construction. With the next one, with the self-cleaning aspect, there's been a team at MIT in 2008. They created a biodegradable dry adhesive bandage, which they proposed could be used in uh, both internally and externally in surgeries to seal wounds. And because of the self-cleaning factor, uh, it could be used in minimally invasive procedures where it could be folded up really small, inserted through small incisions, and then unfolded once it's inside and still be able to do its job. And with the last aspect, with the dry adhesive part, there's been a lot of propositions looking into how these could be applied in critical environments like space or in vacuums where wet adhesives would evaporate and fail. And just so much has come out of just study, just starting with, from Keller Autumn's team, looking at just a couple species of these little geckos and how this has had mass, could in the future have massive impacts on our everyday lives. So much of the time, science is about big ideas, the rapid expansion of the universe, the complex process of converting between oxygen and carbon dioxide and maintaining an equilibrium across the globe, the evolution of modern day species from single-celled organisms to uh, complex multi-celled organisms capable of speech and thought. And everything we've discussed here today with the geckos, it's part of a field which concerns itself with the complete opposite. Nanotechnology is the construction and research of things at the nanoscale. To give you a little bit of context, one nanometer is one billionth smaller than a meter, which is just unfathomably small for most of us. And it's a rapidly expanding interdisciplinary field that has done so much in really what's a pretty short period of time where they've been able to do things with the new technology. And I had the opportunity to hear a talk at MSU last spring by a researcher whose team had created these little tiny robots modeled after, after water bugs, which could be released into contaminated water sources and then filter at the water, and then they themselves be filtered out. There's tons of stuff happening with carbon nanofiber tubes, which are one ten thousandth the thickness of a human hair, but made out of the same thing in the graphite of your pencil. And they can be used in the electrodes of batteries to create stronger, longing lasting batteries. Again, in a biomedical engineering context, to refuse bone structures or release antibiotics as they break down. In environmental sciences, to clean up oil spills. Um, 
there's just so much happening with nanotechnology and it's just an incredible field. So I'd like to take a step back for a moment and thank all of you for listening to me talk. I've been going on for nine or ten odd minutes now and I usually don't get this far about geckos and science without someone telling me to shut up, so thank you. <laughs> um, I, I understand geckos aren't everybody's thing, but the thing is, everybody has a thing. Highly specialized research is so important. There's a team, uh, the Grant couple, that have been studying what have been come to known as Darwin's finches on one of the smaller Galapagos Islands from 1973 to 2012. That's almost 40 years. And what they've been able to do, just this one couple in observing these finches and documenting everything um, from the number of individuals to their wingspan to their beak size is been incredible. They've been able to observe some of Darwin's basic principles of evolution in action. There was a drought one year which influenced the size of seeds that were available for the birds to eat and they were able to document significant long-term changes in the size of the bird's beaks and it just did so much for that field and our future it, it's built on this highly specialized research and like I said everybody has a thing for me it's geckos for the grant couple it was finches for you I don't know what it is Maybe there's one specific type of flower that just really, really interests you. Roses, or maybe it's circuit boards. Or I don't know. That's up to you to go out there and figure out. So, like I said, our future, it's, it's built on this highly specialized research, and it's waiting for us. So why not be part of it? Thank you. <laughs>